morning. Welcome, welcome, um, welcome to, to my podcast, Douglas Dietrich. Um, you are a military historian and um, author, and I hope my sound is okay. Um, you sound great. So Oh, thank you. So um, it, it's morning over here in, in England, and I don't I don't know what time it is with you over there in America. Oh, 4 a.m. Oh, wow. You're up late. Oh, honey, I'm always up at night. <laughs> I'm a creature of the night. Oh, that's uh, fantastic. That's fantastic. Um, so I just wanted to pick your brain as regards military history. <clears throat> Excuse these planes flying overhead. Um, about what going on currently in the UK um, and as regards America. So currently at the UK we have Prince Harry who has um, launched an attack on the British press, um, helped of course by, um, you know, lawyers. So the lawyers mostly seem to come from Israel, uh, Gunnar Cook's Israel, the lawyer David Sherbourne, um, you know, here's the links of Israel, um, his Jewish ancestry, um, so I'm wondering, you know, they're making their um, most, well, they're aiming their guns at the Daily Mail. Now, the Daily Mail is run by Lord Rothermere. <clears throat> he, um, I think it was his father or his grandfather, met with Hitler at one point. I'm yes. wondering, is this about something else rather than, oh, the press are really naughty yada yada is it to close the press because of what's going to happen you know i i believe events are going to get take a darker turn for the world is it a preparation that we the public won't know anything because i know the americans are involved in this uh netflix want to do a movie about it how bad the british press have been how they want to shut them all down what is going on spiritually and also, I'm, I'm wondering, is it linked with what's going on um, in Russia at the moment? The UK is very involved in that as well. Yes, it's all um, it's all interconnected, very much so. And uh, what this uh, ultimately goes back to is the fact that we live in a very global world. It's been rendered more and more global as time has gone on. There's been a kind of reaction against globalization. And a lot of this has to do with concepts of sovereignty. And uh, sovereignty, of course, among nations is uh, something that uh, is considered sacred by many. And we have a uh, situation in which they feel that that sovereignty is being infringed upon. This was obviously the case in England itself. And this is what ultimately led to Brexit. And um, what th there's, there's a conflict of ironies here. And there's a conflict of, of course, a kind of uh, infighting among interest groups. Um, so we need to basically kind of step back. And when we take a look at this situation by starting off with Harry, uh, you're talking about there's already conflict within the royal family. There's conflict within the royal family that Harry seems to thrive off of or uh, definitely needs to, at this point in his life, in a sense, live off of. Now, it's not that he and his wife are uh, in any way, shape or form impoverished. But uh, doubtless, with the kind of lifestyle that they need, they feel a need for a steady source of income. And so uh, one of the things that they're attempting to do is if they can't um, soak the royal family that they've severed from to a degree for any further uh, uh, well funds, then uh, they can uh, soak other institutions. And uh, one of them would be uh, the press. Uh, they, of course, feel that they've been, uh, or at least project uh, the claim that they've been abused by the press. And uh, I find um, that to be, um, shall we say, uh, it's certainly debatable. It is what it is. Uh, they are celebrities after all, and celebrities who um, render themselves in the public eye uh, to such a degree are going to uh, receive some scathing commentary and some attempts at analysis uh, concerning their behavior. Um, some of this may have been uh, a bit uh, abusive in some some degree, but um, it, that that would tend to fall more towards individuals rather than the institution as a whole. So, um, yeah, kind of, don't, don't, yeah, don't you think that um, I believe that Harry has been cynically 
used to batter the press, to stop the freedom of the press. I think he's being manipulated. He might well be. Uh, it's uh, this. This is something that uh, when you take a look at, of course, uh, his uh, battery of attorneys, it would not be surprising if he's hiring expensive attorneys that many of them would ultimately uh, have their headquartered um, offices uh, in uh, Israel. Uh, that's apparently what this traces back to that has certainly been brought to my attention. So uh, with that in mind, of course, uh, it could be that um, the attorneys have convinced him to up the ante to basically uh, take this to the point where there's more of a sense of uh, a lever uh, to be applied over the press. And uh, all of this might have to do with a, uh, a a kind of campaign to manipulate the public with a new agenda of information or misinformation, uh, depending on how one looks at it. But when it comes to the royal family, there's obviously infighting going on. And uh, there, whereas Harry has no hope of uh, rejoining the family and starting a new dynasty or, or doing anything in a rival sense, uh, then his interests become, uh, by logic, more internationalized. So he's, his uh, stance now is that of um, someone who is, in a sense, attacking his homeland uh, via via the press. And uh, this is um, perhaps manipulated. We, we can certainly look into that and find out whether there's further conclusions to be drawn. Um, that being said, concerning the connection with Russia and um, everything else, let's put it this way. Uh, in terms of uh, the situation with Britain, with Russia, with Brexit, with uh, Israel, um, what we already have is a triad, uh, a triangular situation, which is extraordinarily interconnected. And uh, this interconnectivity uh, began, of course, uh, a long time ago. Uh, the um, British, uh, the British involvement with a kind of uh, uh, Jewish dynastic um, a input or influx into the British political system uh, was most pronounced at the time of Benjamin Disraeli. And at the time of Benjamin Disraeli and the, uh, the fact that he uh, made a show of converting to Christianity while being ethnically Jewish, uh, he came to control a great deal of the British Empire, or a better way to express it would be that he helped the British Empire expand through imperialism, and he was a very Machiavellian decisive factor in this. Uh, he was greatly respected for his uh, sense of uh, political savvy. Uh, this was an individual whose government, uh, so to speak, fell only with uh, the defeat of the British forces by the Kingdom of the Zulus. It was around that time that you had kind of a collapse and a restructuring of the British government in uh, as impacted by its uh, uh, colonial setback at that time. When uh, you take into account um, uh, the attitude that the British had that was rather peculiar that developed called British uh, Israelism or the British Israelite belief that uh, many of the holy sites in the Bible uh, described as being in the Levantine or uh, what today would be understood as the Middle East, more ge geographically it would be referred to more correctly as Southwest Asia, uh, going into Afro-Asia once you cross into Egypt. Uh, you had a situation where um, many British people believed that uh, they themselves uh, were the chosen people, that uh, the uh, Anglo-Israelite movement uh, was based on a sense of the British people being the book of the Bible. Uh, this was, of course, one of the uh, either precursors or collateral developments of, of the King James uh, revision of the Bible through his Oxford scholars. And uh, with that, you had uh, the development, of course, uh, a parallel or coeval with that of uh, the Church of England. Uh, so England has its own national Christian identity, which is, of course, important uh, and therefore gives them a, another sense of sovereignty uh, in terms of Brexit. Uh, what was going on was a lot of British were so uh, impacted 
by the two world wars. Uh, the greater British pound sterling was the financial uh, backing of all the world's currencies during the colonial era. Uh, the majority of the world's currencies were at the time, if not uh, autarkic, uh, then they were at least somewhat dependent on the British pound sterling and the vicissitudes of whatever happened to it. It took two world wars to knock the British pound sterling off from its uh, platform as the primary or the preeminent currency, after which the United States dollar uh, at that point uh, usurped it. Uh, but the British were never going to give up the greater British pound sterling. And um, this was one of the factors for never really fully integrating into European Union uh, with the concept of ever converting to the euro. It's, it's something that they never really wanted to happen. So there were all kinds of exceptions made for them in European Union. But um, then the Russians uh, uh, began to go active. Now, this is where people need to understand that with the collapse of the greater Soviet Union, the greater Soviet Union uh, and its empire, and uh, then you had this Weimar period uh, that developed in Russia, this period of absolute chaos. Uh, I don't think any outsiders really could appreciate uh, the amount of chaos that uh, was uh, ongoing in Russia with the collapse of the Soviet Union. Now, just to qualify what I'm saying here, just to remind people, of course, I'm a former Department of Defense librarian. Uh, I do uh, want people to understand that uh, uh, the reason that I understand so much about what went on behind the Iron Curtain was, of course, uh, during the time that I was affiliated with the United States government, nearly a decade, uh, I was actually sent behind the Iron Curtain at one point. Uh, to rendezvous with some Russians that were essentially the only resistance that could be found within the greater Soviet Union. Uh, the, it's important to understand that the Soviet Union was an atheistic state and therefore they could not recognize the existence of a god and therefore they could not recognize the existence of a satanic church, a Satan or a satanic church within their own nation either to, to even admit to the existence of such a phenomenon would be to uh, give credence to the church that they were suppressing. So as a result, I was sent to rendezvous with the Satanist behind the Iron Curtain, uh, represented by Alexander Dugin. Uh, this is, of course, uh, goes to show uh, the influence this man had at the time. Uh, the KGB was not touching him, and ultimately with the collapse of the Soviet Union, through the mach machinations of people like him, uh, he then maneuvered himself as an advisor to Vladimir Putin. As much as the Russians tried to deny it through their propaganda today, his geopolitics book is the textbook for the Russian military academy. You're talking about somebody with tremendous influence, Putin's Rasputin, who was introduced by Alex Jones repeatedly as Putin's brain. Uh, this was in the day when the Russians were much less obtuse about this man's uh, level of influence and his power. Um, his daughter, of course, was ultimately assassinated, but it needs to be remembered that he was very estranged from his daughter. He did not like his daughter at all and is almost certainly responsible for killing her. Um, when she died in an automobile explosion and the vehicle blew up in front of him, he just stood there with his arms in a dramatic pose so he could look outraged, but he did nothing to go in and uh, attempt to help her. <laughs> he just let her burn alive uh, while standing there in a pose uh, to be photographed uh, like, a, like a photo op, like a photo shoot. All of this is very important because it goes to show the direction of the Russian ideology at this point in history. Uh, he's the primary influence uh, of Vladimir Putin. And of course, when Vladimir Putin pulled Russia out of that Weimar period where they had this incredible chaos, um, uh, power outages that were just chronic and constant and uh, everybody, the violence through the roof, crime being the norm for the economy, uh, then he uh, essentially set Russia out on a um, uh, offensive uh, agenda one in which they would reclaim the empire. And in terms of his thinking, it's very imperialist, it's very sovereignty oriented. And so he promoted this propaganda campaign uh, throughout Europe and uh, very aggressively in England. And England uh, at that point 
was starting what I would call an interregnal empire, uh, already in the midst of an interregnal empire. Now, Britain, of course, is by um, force of circumstance, uh, incredibly adaptable. The British uh, people have, uh, they're an island people with very few natural resources. Uh, the weather is terrible. Uh, the uh, output of uh, food is nowhere near anything that can support the population as it's grown with the Industrial Revolution. So Britain, by its very circumstances, has been forced to establish empire. And whenever they've lost an empire, such as they did in North America, they simply started another one. Now, um, during the period after World War II, when Britain was essentially suffering uh, the wave of decolonization that World War II triggered, then what happened was that Britain began to adapt by becoming an empire of offshore accounts. So this interregnal empire, which is an invisible empire, is one in which they started offshore accounts in their commonwealth nations like Bermuda and various other uh, areas, literally offshore, and uh, then enabled uh, further corruption of their society by basically selling off much of their own property. Uh, if something isn't designated as a historic building or site in England, a, a lot of times a foreigner will purchase it. And this foreigner will then rent it out like it's an Airbnb or something and basically uh, take something and uh, turn it into basically a safe house for foreign criminals or an operating center for foreign spies. Now, now there's anyone who thinks that this is somehow a lurid recounting of the situation in Britain, we have to recount that Skripal, who was a Russian defector, was uh, they attempted to assassinate him by deploying a military grade weapon of mass destruction in the middle of London. These people de deployed a nerve gas, the Russians, by these people, I mean. They, uh, they deployed a, a, a field grade nerve agent uh, to take this guy out and they killed some British people. Uh, it's important to remember many British people were injured and one ultimately died, at least one ultimately died. One might be on a ventilator the rest of their life, uh, the last time that I checked. So British people have been attacked by uh, military grade weapon of mass destruction on their own, uh, within the capital of their own nation by the Russians. And the Russians were allowed to get away with it with impunity. So understand for all intents and purposes, uh, the British have been suffering under a Russian occupation government effectively until very recently. And uh, it was the war in Ukraine that is enabling the British to finally fight back. But it's this Russian occupation government that maneuvered the British into Brexit. It was they who were pushing this whole concept that the European Union was the ultimate objective of Adolf Hitler, that Adolf Hitler's Third Reich was uh, his objective was to unify Europe. Well, no, sh <laughs> no shit. It's like, uh, obviously, everyone from Charlemagne to Napoleon Bonaparte uh, to Adolf Hitler, anybody uh, who's come to power in Europe has tried to create a united Europe in order to create a more cohesive economic and uh, socioeconomic entity that would be independent of other great powers. Uh, Europe, of course, uh, suffers from fratricidal warfare. And because of uh, Hitler's uh, success in laying the groundwork for European Union with a dominant Germany at its center, uh, then the British felt that they were under some kind of German occupation. Now, this is the irony of this. Understand the irony here is that uh, the British were given this, there's very few things that are grown are in Britain. Uh, they do their best to produce some things. Uh, there are, there's an incredible advancement in uh, biomimetics or uh, basically uh, robotics or automatons that uh, emulate uh, biological function. Uh, unknown to many people, there's been a tremendous advance in Britain in this regard. Uh, Britain can revolutionize and innovate. Uh, it's been forced to do that over the generations because of its situation of having very few natural resources. Uh, but when it comes to things produced there, um, like food, <laughs> there's very little food produced in England. Uh, so they got a great deal with the European Union, 
And yet, with all the Russian campaign and all of the finances ultimately traced back to Russia behind many of these shills and charlatans and political hacks who were promoting Brexit. And by the way, I'm going to tell people that as as impractical as Brexit was, uh, Britain has to work with it now. And um, it's probably in the end for the best. You don't fight history, you use it. And it's best to work with history now. And Britain has to, as I've said, actually start a real empire again because it has no other choice. But when it comes to, and Russia will play a part in that, but when it comes to the uh, situation as it started, the Russians were on top. They were very much living all over London. They had bought property everywhere. All of Russians, uh, billionaires, their multi-billionaires, their moguls had uh, British property, uh, were partying in London incessantly and uh, were able to kill defectors that uh, stood up to them in London with impunity, with impunity. There were no repercussions for the deployment of a mass, a weapon of mass destruction in the middle of London for the Russians, diplomatically or otherwise. Uh, this is why you can effectively say, honestly, with that and uh, that they had, in effect, an occupation government over England. Uh, their investments were so steep that uh, the British just let them literally get away with murder. So when it came to that, the tables are turning now. Uh, the Russians tripped over their own dick. <laughs> they just basically uh, pushed the Brits towards Brexit by saying, you, you see, European Union is Hitler's victory, and that means that you're really under German occupation, and uh, they're depriving you of your sovereignty. And, and uh, enough of the British public went for it so that by a minuscule fraction, uh, Brexit went through, and the repercussions are catastrophic. <laughs> they, they are now Britain is going through its Weimar period. Uh, it, prices are through the roof, uh, and uh, people are unable to get bare necessities. It is uh, the situation is devastating. Uh, so the one thing Britain has is a at least semi-functional military. We could point out all of the shortcomings, but it's still light years ahead of most everyone else. And uh, as a result, the British uh, have uh, supported the Ukrainians in uh, their fight for survival. Now, for people who are unfamiliar with the situation, uh, understand that, as I expressed last time in past interviews, uh, and I'll just uh, summarize it as quickly as possible. People need to understand that uh, many centuries ago, uh, there was, uh, of course, millennia ago, a, uh, a, a Jewish dictate from uh, the entity that they took to be their god, the god of Abraham, to go on a rampage of genocide and mass extermination. Uh, this uh, was to be burnt as an offering unto God. And the term for this kind of mass extermination, where the population is to be utterly consumed by fire as an offering to this mad God of the desert, was the term Holocaust. Uh, this was the ancient uh, Hebraic uh, term for their version of what the Christians would call a crusade or what the Muslims would call a jihad. So when the uh, people of ancient uh, uh, Judea went uh, to war against the uh, Canaanites or other surrounding desert tribes, uh, the order is biblical. Uh, kill them all, every man, woman, and child, and burn the land unto the root, and all of this shall be offered up unto God, a divine dictate of mass murder. Uh, which the uh, ancient Israelites carried out with fanatical abandon. And uh, so these holocausts were carried out to the point of carrying the Jewish faith of forced conversion further abroad to the point where the Hazar, a warrior tribe of Turkic peoples, was uh, converted ultimately to this faith. And uh, they became uh, the Hazar Empire that uh, ultimately um, uh, conquered and enslaved many people who came to be known as slaves, the Slavs. 
Uh, of course, Slavic people will insist that this meant um, Slava, as in celebration, celebration of faith, um, celebration of their ultimate freedom. But they're only celebrating their ultimate freedom because they were once Slavs, as in slaves. And so the Slavic people were conquered by the Hazar, and their remnants later were, uh, well, they had an empire from the Baltic to the Black Sea, known as the Jewish Pale of Settlement. So this Jewish Pale of Settlement um, were the elite who had the money that they had taken from the conquered peoples, meaning the land that they were able to exploit and the peoples they were able to enslave, gave them the resources to uh, have education, ultimately adapt with civilization and become doctors, attorneys, uh, accountants, uh, all of these famous, very stereotypical careers for this particular people of the book, which is how they've always been known. Uh, at the time of uh, the Tsar, uh, these people were um, the uh, Hazar descendants, the uh, Turks who had converted to Judaism, were the masters, the master race of that part of the world. And this encompassed, of course, Ukraine or the Ukraine, the borderland, as well as Belarus, White Russia, and of course the Baltic littoral, Latvia, Lithuania, Estonia. Uh, what happened was later on the Teutonic Knights liberated the Baltic littoral, the uh, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, uh, Ost Prussia uh, was formed based on the uh, Teutonic Knights germanizing the region. Uh, it was the Tsar who then later on uh, occupied the other Russias. And this is why we used to hear the term all the Russias, Tsar of all the Russias, meaning he was Tsar of Mother Russia, as well as Ukraine and Belarus. And uh, however, we have to remember, these are um, people with their own identities who, unlike the Mother Russians, had been the original hearth of the Viking culture, the Viking culture, which is the real source of the Russian culture, it was the river Vikings, the Vikings who, instead of raiding the coasts of Western Europe, had gone inland on the rivers. These river Vikings became the source of uh, ancient Kievan Rus, the uh, Russians of Kiev. This is, of course, the source of Ukraina, the real Russians. And uh, these are the Viking Russians are in the Ukraine. And uh, then what happened was uh, jump ahead to uh, essentially uh, uh, World War II. We can get back to other uh, phases of history later. But when uh, you had at that point uh, the Bolsheviks uh, launching the revolution, it was heavily Judaified. It was Judaified because uh, unlike communist China, where the overwhelming majority of the communists were natives who were in country, fighting a guerrilla warfare uh, campaign, uh, most of the Russian Revolution was orchestrated by exiled intellectuals. Uh, the Kaiser had to ship Lenin back in a boxcar back to Russia in order to instigate his revolution. It wasn't like Lenin really wanted to go. It was the Kaiser wanted to get rid of him. And when the Kaiser did, he rallied with fellow criminals, literal gangsters like uh, uh, Stalin, and Stalin is simply his criminal name, uh, which was uh, Man of Steel, it, uh, Steel Man, it wasn't, uh, wasn't his birth name. And uh, Joseph Stalin was Georgian, and uh, when he uh, took over Russia through the Bolshevik Revolution, of course there was Lenin, but then he took over after Lenin. Uh, what happened was they had to basically create a cast of people who could run the empire. Now, since the only people who could read or write in general, other than the Russian elite, which they were attempting to kill, uh, were not the peasants who would sign everything with an X, um, the majority of the peasantry was illiterate. The only people who could manage the new Soviet system were the Jewish people of the, de of the Pale of Settlement. So these people, the Hazar, then became the Kamazars. So since the Soviet Union was basically a Kamazarocracy with machine guns, it was effectively a Judeo-Bolshevik empire. This is where that term came from. So these former Jewish middle class people became the Kamazars who held the power of life and death over everyone. And what they did was they took the breadbasket of effectively the world, 
Ukraine, where 25% of the world's black soil is located, the most fertile soil in the world, over a quarter of it is in the Ukraine. And therefore, the Ukrainians are one of the few nations on earth that can produce more food than they can eat. They are the world's breadbasket. If Russia conquers the Ukraine, then combined with their own food resources, which are considerable, together Russia would uh, control almost half the world's food supply, it's certainly in terms of grain. So uh, in terms of uh, the Ukrainians, uh, uh, Stalin wanted to feed Mother Russia. So despite the fact that the Ukrainians produced so much food, the Russians stole it all through the Jewish commissars. So the Jewish commissars were responsible for the death of 15 million Ukrainians in what was called the Holodomor, the Great Famine, in which uh, far more Ukrainians died than, uh, than Jewish people were to die in the Holocaust, as it came to be known, of Europe. So it's, this is the reason, of course, why the Ukrainians collaborated with the Third Reich to basically annihilate as many of these Jewish people as possible. This is why Babi Yar, the largest massacre in Eastern Europe outside of a death camp, occurred in the ravines of Babi Yar in Ukraine with the cooperation from the Ukrainian people uh, with the Third Reich uh, to eliminate the people who had mass murdered so many of them with a sense of biblical superiority, uh, even though they were not ethnically even Jewish. So we must remember that these Hazar people are not ethnically Jewish uh, it, at all. They're Turkic, uh, which means they're Caucasoid, Turkic, uh, far more genetically related to the people of Anatolia or Turkey. And uh, they later, after the fall of uh, the Third Reich on the surface world, uh, many of them mass migrated to Israel. So they are a white ethnic, uh, white supremacist, uh, alien uh, white settler regime uh, that has established an apartheid state in Palestine. So this is the important thing to recall. These are not ethnically Jewish people. Later on, many Shephardim or other kinds of Jews did migrate to Israel. They're not the majority at all, uh, and it, even less so after the collapse of the Soviet Union. With the collapse of the Greater Soviet Union in 1991, most of the uh, Jewish people from uh, Russia tried to emigrate to the United States. Uh, they had help from evangelicals like Pat Boone, who used to run all night commercials for to get people to donate to bring Jews to the United States. And uh, so in terms of this, the United States government finally said, no, enough is enough and uh, told Israel, you've got to start forcing these people to relocate to Israel. We're not going to take any more of the Russian Jewish emigres. Uh, it was plain and simple. That's how it went down. Uh, this is because it was beginning to impact, impact America's economy in ways that, uh, that if I were to describe them, people would simply think I was being lurid and, and, and uh, somewhat uh, ridiculous. But uh, you, just to give you an example of what happened, um, uh, the United States used to have a massive civil defense program preparing for a third world war in case there was a nuclear exchange. We had nuclear uh, bunkers all over the United States. Indeed, it was required by law that apartment homes should have a bomb shelter. The apartment that I grew up in in the Tenderloin, which is the, the most dangerous area of San Francisco, one of the most dangerous areas, there's a few others that rival it, uh, but San Francisco itself is one of the most dangerous cities in the world. So I grew up in the most dangerous part of the most dangerous city in the world. And even that apartment, the El Cerrito apartments at 270 Turk Street, uh, which the police called the compound, had its own bomb shelter. So all of these places with bomb shelters had them stocked by the US government. And this includes lots of alcohol, because that would be needed after a nuclear war for dressing wounds, as well as just forgetting one's troubles. Uh, they had bandages, they had dried cans, food supplied, powdered food. Um, many of the, for how this happened, I really don't know, but I do know that it did happen because I worked with the US government for almost 10 years. For some reason, when the Russian Jewish immigrants were coming to the United States, 
Someone gave them access to bomb shelters all over the US and they denuded all of them of all of their supplies. They denuded them of all of the canned food, the powdered food, the uh, band-aids, the, uh, all the alcohol. Uh, everything was taken and all of America's uh, urban bomb shelters were completely left without anything. They, they, they no, are no longer any supplies in any of them. Uh, so they've essentially been uh, looted. Uh, so after this la mass looting, the U.S. government said, OK, we're, we're not taking any more Jews from Russia. Israel has to take them in. None of them wanted to go to Israel because then they would be forced to serve in the Israeli army uh, because it's required. Uh, but ever since they were forced to go to Israel, then what happened was that Israel became uh, more and more Russified. So it's important to understand that the Umgangsprache, the native language of uh, at least a third of the population of Israel is Russian. Uh, modern Israel is not the Israel of the 60s or 70s, which was already an alien apartheid regime, a, a white settler regime established over Palestine. Now it is compounded by the fact that the uh, all of its uh, voting pamphlets, uh, instructions for uh, food preparation on boxes has to be bilingual not only in Hebrew, but also in Russian. So these young Russians now are the dominant political force in Israel. They have become the most, uh, one of the most uh, influential uh, populations in Israel uh, by their sheer numbers. Uh, so we have to understand that Israel, which was always very communistic, very atheistic, uh, we, for American evangelicals, who are so locked in this biblical fundamentalist interpretation where they think that, quote unquote, the Jews are relatives of the Bahas, uh, members of the master race on earth, uh, brothers of Christ, uh, genetically. Uh, uh, this delusion is uh, false on the face of it in the fact that none of these people who established the original state of Israel were ethnically Jewish. These were people who were Hazar or Turkic descended. Uh, now are compounded by the fact that the majority of them are half Slav. Uh, so you've got this godless, uh, atheist, communist, uh, educated elite in Israel that now controls about a, a third of its politics and uh, at this point uh, is becoming the future uh, majority in the sense of at least being politically the most influential, the most aggressive. So what started off as uh, idealistically socialist and communist and atheistic because the original Hazar from Eastern Europe who settled into Palestine were overwhelmingly atheistic socialists is now compounded uh, into anchoring itself as a pro-Russian satellite. So you have this influence from uh, Israel, uh, which is uh, essentially ideologically Marxist, uh, economically uh, extraordinarily rapaciously capitalist, uh, very much like communist China. Think communist politics, capitalist economics. Uh, so this is why they relate uh, so heavily with communist China to the point where the Americans had to send diplomats to say, uh, you have to make a choice. It's us or them, them or us, uh, which finally caused Israel to have uh, at least an about face on the face of it, it's all prima facie, but they claim to have toned down their satellite status with communist China. But the reality is Israel at this point is very much the nexus of the Sino-Slavic Synaxis or the Russia-China uh, emergent axis along with India that is uh, developing uh, in antithesis to the United States and the United Kingdom. We're, we're talking about a, uh, the Asian Indians, of course, have a enormous love affair with Israel uh, because they're looking for a replacement for the former Soviet Union. Uh, Asian India was constantly at war with Pakistan, which was a satellite state of both the United States and China. These are super massive uh, engagements, conflicts in which both Pakistan and India saw the largest tank battles in the world since World War II take place in the Thar Desert, the killing field of the tanks. 
and uh, the Asian Indians got their supplies from Russia right up to and including an aircraft carrier and uh, as well as uh, their armored mechanized columns, their their firearms. The Pakistanis purchased everything from the United States and communist China and therefore the Asian Indians have uh, always viewed the Russians as their primary source of uh, doctrine and uh, weapons of war. All of that has changed now with the Russian uh, exposure as a paper tiger in the Ukraine. The Asian Indians are now counting on everything from Israel. So it's a uh, new development. And so what you have is a Sino-Slav Indic Synaxis, meaning Slav as in Russia, uh, China, the, uh, the communists on the mainland, the communist Chinese empire, and then the Asian Indians. And all of it, the nexus is Israel. Uh, and what is it they want? Well, uh, BRICS. Uh, BRICS is, of course, an economic union of Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa, which was taken over by the communists at the time of Nelson Mandela. For those who don't are unaware of this, Nelson Mandela's party was a communist party. Uh, he was funded by the Soviets. So when apartheid fell in South Africa, uh, South Africa became a communist nation state. Uh, and at that point, it allied with uh, Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa, the BRICS alliance. And they seek uh, the downfall of the United States. This is their stated objective. This is not something that is that's being imposed like I'm reading into it. This is this is something they've stated very loudly uh, and uh, very officially. Uh, so the enemy alliance is already formed, but what they don't mention is its nexus point is Israel. So with that bear being born in mind, we have to remember that the battle lines are being drawn for a global conflagration. Uh, the um, Israelis are very definitely on the side of the Turks. Uh, this has been most uh, evidenced in the recent war against Armenia. So to put this into some perspective for people, Armenia, uh, well, the Armenian culture is one of the oldest cultures on earth, one of the first cultures to convert en masse to Christianity. So the Armenian mountains are where Noah's Ark uh, originally landed in the flood that occurred in the Black Sea. This is quite historical, it's extra biblical, only in the sense that it is manifestly proven. It is scientifically established that there was a flood in the Black Sea with the retreat of the Ice Age. And this flood in the Black Sea was the biblical flood. This is what led to uh, a change in human consciousness because of the uh, destruction of the farming communities around the Black Sea, which then led to agriculture being spread to uh, essentially the rest of humanity thereafter. Uh, and uh, so around this area, the epicenter, we have Armenia and uh, being one of the first people to convert to Christianity, they were one of the first people persecuted for their faith, originally under the Roman Empire and uh, then by the Turks in World War I. Uh, well, my biological sire, Adolf Hitler, who we've spoken of in other transmissions, was the man who said, uh, who remembers the Armenians? Uh, he's referring to during World War I, the Turks murdered two million of them uh, at the very least. And so the millions of Armenians that were slaughtered are testament to Christian persecution by a Muslim empire, uh, the Turks, in the 20th century. Now, with this very recent horrible scar of, uh, of genocide, uh, some of the most rabid people to speak against the Armenians, to try and deny their genocide, aside from the Turks, have all too often been Jewish lobbies backed by Israel. Israel refuses to recognize the Armenian genocide because this would give them a competitor in the monopoly of pain and suffering on earth. And so they actively, and none of this is myself, imposing some kind of assumption. This is something that is undeniably and incontrovertibly documented. The Israelis supplied killer drones to the Turks and the Azeris to massacre the Armenians. So the Armenians, of course, have an enclave in Nagorno-Karabakh, 
and uh, they were still using these old Soviet prestige platforms, tanks and the like for their weapons, and they paid the price. With the revolution in warfare, the drones used by the Turks, which is a drone superpower, Turkey, eh? and uh, the drones provided by the Israelis, wiped their army off the map and forced the first surrender of a nation in generations. The last time a nation actually formally surrendered to another nation was when the Pakistanis surrendered to the Asian Indians to avoid a nuclear war. Uh, so this time the Armenians surrendered and now people in the uh, ethnic enclave of Nagorno-Karabakh are threatened with genocide. And uh, who is on their side? Nobody. The Russians are worthless. Uh, Putin refused to help them during the war with the Turks because he's a slave circuited to Israel. Uh, Israel is attempting to annihilate the Armenian Christian people. Uh, they are on the side of the Turks and the Azeris, their quote unquote Muslim enemy. Israel has signed a peace accord with the House of Saud. The House of Saud is, is think about this, uh, the very name Saudi Arabia is an insult to the human race. Uh, what you have in that case is first off a, a, a royal house which has given its name to its population. And it's not even the original royal house. The original royal house that ruled over al Makkah and al Medina, the most sacred sites of Islam, Mecca and Medina, uh, the original protector of these sites was the kingdom of Jordan, the Hashemite dynasty. Uh, His Highness, the king of Jordan, had to retreat to that little nation that is barred from the sea by Israel uh, because the British drove them out. The British drove out the Hashemite dynasty and installed a group of camel thieves uh, called the Saudi and then made them totally dependent on the British Empire for their guns and their maintenance of power. And thus the House of Saud was established as the quote unquote protector of Islam's holy sites. They're usurpers. They were the people Osama bin Laden wanted to dethrone because He knew that they were the invaders of the Hajj or the protected sites on the coast of the Red Sea. And so when uh, you have the House of Saud take over the Arabian Peninsula and they give everyone their names, it would be like titling England, Windsor, England, and every British person being forced to reference themselves as a Windsorite. Uh, Oh, I'm a Windsorite from uh, the Isles of Windsor. That, that th- imagine the absurdity there or everyone in America, uh, Halliburton Corporation. We're all Halliburtoni. We all belong to the Halliburton North America. Uh, and uh, this is the kind of insanity that is unleashed on uh, the Arabian Peninsula and the House of Saud. Of course, they are now firmly allied with Israel. Again, this is not something where I'm projecting some kind of lurid fantasy where I'm paranoid, I'm I'm building some kind of paranoid intellectual castle out of sand. These are documented alliances where the uh, United Arab Emirates and uh, the House of Saud have thrown the Palestinians under the bus. They've all said, you know, to hell with the Palestinians. The Israelis can murder them all. We couldn't care less. Uh, and they are now allied firmly with Israel. This is what makes the assault on our media so unforgivable, so inexcusable, because it's in the past, Israel could have said, we are surrounded by Arab enemies. And for that reason, we have to ally with Turkey because they're ethnically different. And for that reason, we get some oil through Azerbaijan because the Azeris are ethnically Turkic and therefore allied with the Turks. And because we uh, geopolitically are dependent on that Azeri oil, there would be at least a geopolitical and economic rationale for supplying them in their war against the Christian Armenians. But because the Israelis had signed this incredible accord where they now get extraordinarily cheap oil from the House of Saud, the United Arab Emirates, and all these oil-soaked spots of sand in the desert, the Israelis had free-flowing oil 
There was no geopolitical need to do what they did to the Armenians. What they do is out of pure evil. Out of the pure gratuitous sadistic desire to exterminate a Christian people. An entire Christian race off the map. This is what we need to confront. What we need to confront is the fact that uh, in Israel you have had a Herodian takeover. Uh, this is not something that where I'm going biblical for the sake of drama. This is their ideology to put this into perspective for some people. Understand for those of you who are not all that biblically literate and there's less and less people that are and maybe that's for the best. But uh, Herod was the man who was installed by the Romans and Edomai, uh, Edom meaning red as in the red sands of his nation. Uh, one of the neighbors of Israel that was a bitter blood enemy, uh, most hated in the Bible. Uh, it, the Edomites, of course, uh, when the Romans took over, were installed as the ruling dynasty over Israel as the ultimate insult. So they took Herod, who was an alien, uh, by that I mean a foreign individual, uh, alien to Israeli culture, the Judeo culture, he was installed as their king. And here was Herod, an enemy of an enemy race, the Edomites, installed as the ruler of Israel. And then when the Magi out of China, and again, I refer people as always to the revelation of the Magi, uh, a book that should have been part of the Bible, but was like many others, uh, destined to be separated into apocrypha status by the Council of Nicaea and other uh, political uh, groups that uh, these gatherings that for political reasons decided what went into the Bible and what did not. Uh, the politics of that time left the revelation of the Magi out because people felt it was too threatening to their sense of regional identity to admit that the wise men, over a dozen of them, not three, sourced out of China. Uh, but this is exposed in the Revelation of the Magi, written in the original Syriac, hundreds of years old, uh, that was put to the paper uh, barely a hundred years after the death of Christ, in which the Magi are unmistakably Chinese. So they took an army with them to cross the desert, an army of retainers, meaning basically an expeditionary force. They invaded Israel. And the Romans could do nothing to stop them. And they demanded the Christ child. And this, of course, identified this as a threat to Herod, who they confronted. And uh, for that reason, Herod recognized that this Christ child must be the descendant of the Davidian throne, meaning he was a direct threat to Herod. So Herod ordered the mass murder of every firstborn son in Israel. Now, all of this happened. This is historical as well as biblical. Today's Israel and their scholars are attempting to revise that history and say that never happened. Why would they do this? Because Herod was understandably paranoid that the Israelis would kill him. And because of that, he ordered the building of massive castles all over Palestine. And he wanted them to be within assets no matter where he went. So he was the man who built the only solid artifacts that you can see in Israel for tourists. Uh, people who think of Israel as this holy land full of holy sites, they don't understand the history was when Constantine converted to Christianity, his mother went around the Levantine and said, this is the well at which Christ drank. This is the Mount of Olives. This is Mount Golgotha. This is Gethsemane. His mother, the mother of Constantine, is the woman who basically created many of these sites out of basically a mystical intuition. So no archaeologist recognizes those sites. Archaeologically in Israel, there is nothing that is recognized as biblical. <laughs> the only thing that's recognized as really biblical in Israel are the castles of Harad, which are everywhere. Uh, and if it were not for them, there would be nothing archaeologically to see in Israel. 
uh, it's a general statement, but it holds as as a generalization. And so uh, because he provided so much for tourists to look at, the Israelis have actually put his likeness on coinage or currency. He's uh, respected in Israel. He's their hero. Uh, so it's important to understand now that the uh, people of Israel politically are very Herodian. They have a Herodian ideology. Uh, they are the new Herodians. Uh, these are the people who hold in esteem the man who would have killed your God if he could have, uh, if you're a Christian. So this is extraordinarily important to uh, articulate, and it's extraordinarily important to articulate they're not ethnically uh, even Jewish. And so you have this incredible Frankensteinian pastiche artificial anti-culture in the Levantine that is now impacting the world and it's impacting England. So now England's fighting back. It's fighting back in the Ukraine. It's taking the side of the Ukraine and it's fighting back the Russians who are but puppets of the state. And uh, ultimately, uh, if the British defeat and they're at the forefront, it's the British who are crossing all the red lines more than the Americans in Ukraine. Uh, if they defeat the forces on the field of the Russians, they have essentially defeat Russia. It cannot survive that defeat. Uh, the Putin regime will likely collapse. Whatever takes over might be worse, but how long can it last? Uh, eventually, Russia will collapse much sooner than later into a wasteland of warlords and nuclear meltdowns. Uh, it is Russia that is destined to become the new British Raj because the British are at the forefront of defeating it they most certainly will be in on essentially reconstructing it. Uh, this is a great opportunity for England. Um, as I said before, the English people uh, have another partner that's outside of the European Union that was never part of the European Union, the Norwegians. Norway is one of the wealthiest nations on earth based on its oil money. The British had that potential. They had the North Sea oil fields, an equal amount of access to resources that the Norwegians had. Where did all the money go? It was completely stolen. Completely. This is part of the corruption that has hit all of the allies of World War II. Uh, how is it that Russia is so dysfunctional, despite the fact they claim they won World War II with their massive, unbeatable military? How is it that the British, who had North Sea oil, are not in oil power, but are instead paying through the roof for gas at home. How is it that America is a third world nation in so many respects in that it can no longer even conduct the basic demand, cater to the basic demand of any nation state, which is to preserve the life of its people. I mean, forget the mass shootings for a moment. The American lifespan is the shortest lifespan of all the developed nations on earth. So with America's lifespan being so short, shorter than even England's, uh, America has proven itself incapable of keeping its citizens alive. How is it that all these allies who claim to have won the war are in such dire straits? Well, the one thing that they've all had in common is this incredible connection to Israel, where they've been slave circuited to sponsoring this Frankensteinian anti-culture, this, this nation state that is not a nation state, which none of them even officially recognized until Trump was made president, hacked in by the Russians, no less. And that's not some kind of sour grapes stated by a Democrat. That's a historical fact that all of America's intelligence agencies have confirmed. And so when you hear Israelis speak, they literally say, Trump is the best president Israel ever had because he recognized, of course, Jerusalem as the capital. Understand that this is the power of, uh, shall we say, the Jewish lobby over the printing press in America or over uh, information dissemination. If you were to look up uh, online the capital of Israel for generations, it would say Jerusalem. And yet it's a lie. That would be in the Encyclopedia Britannica showing their influence over Britain. It would be in the Encyclopedia Americana or various American dictionaries, including Merriam-Webster. 
Uh, all of this is a lie. No nation on earth recognized Jerusalem as the capital of Israel because they didn't recognize Israel as a nation state. They did not have embassies there. The embassies were in Tel Aviv, Yefo, the financial capital of this white settler apartheid regime in the Levantine. And this showed that they did not recognize Jerusalem. Uh, so when it comes to the few nations that did, and I mean like two on earth, they were both like Central American nations like Guatemala and Costa Rica, which literally Israel purchased outright. Israel like literally purchased their governments to recognize Jerusalem, uh, Guatemala and Costa Rica. Uh, and uh, other than that, no one recognized Jerusalem as the capital of Israel until Trump. So it, it, you have this artificial nation state not recognized by any nation, Canada, the Empire of Japan, nobody. Uh, and yet it has this incredible destructive impact on our world. It seeks to destroy an entire Christian race. It is uh, essentially a threat to all humanity. <laughs> it's something that we need to confront is uh, a dire situation which cannot stand. And the kind of alliance that they put together with the oil powers, where they're now floating in cheap oil, while British are freezing to death in their homes, saved only by the onset of spring. Uh, this shows the importance of the Ukrainian conflict, and it shows the importance of the fact that if Britain wants to commit to a sense of sovereignty, then it needs to take on, again, a sense of empire building. Russia as the new Raj, uh, along with the resources that the Britain would gain access to in reconstruction of Russia post-war, uh, the gas, the uh, various fuels, along with Norway, and again, taking advantage of the fact that all of the sheikhs of uh, the Middle Eastern and Arab nations are trained at Sandhurst, uh, right outside London. Uh, the sheikhs of Sandhurst are the people who run North Africa and much of Southwest Asia. Uh, Britain needs to really reestablish itself as the, well, the first it needs to establish a sense of United Kingdoms. If you have kingdoms that can be declared trustworthy, you would historically need to turn towards the true kingdoms. Britain needs to help in a campaign to reestablish the House of Jordan over the Arabian Peninsula, the Hashemite dynasty over Mecca and Medina, liberate the Arabs from this horrible Saudi tyranny that is allied with Israel. Uh, once the Hashemite dynasty is reestablished in uh, the Arabian Peninsula, where they historically belong, and other uh, Arab powers and their leaders are united in kingdoms with Britain. Britain can afford to lose Scotland and still remain a united kingdoms in the plural with such kingdoms as established in North Africa and Southwest Asia. Uh, and they could always take someone like Baron Rothschild, a British baron, and coronate him as the king of Israel. That's something that shows us the necessity for retaining the crown in England. The crown in England is not only justifying their existence by tourism. The crown in England could be the justification for a true sense of United Kingdoms in the plural, uh, where Britain could then be the peacemaker between a kingdom of Israel under a coronated Baron Rothschild and the various Arab nations. This would make England the fuel block of the world, combined with Norway, a Russian Raj, uh, the Russians could be their new native troops. They serve essentially as mercenary forces under Wagner anyway. Uh, the Russians have already converted themselves to a mercenary army. So for that reason, certainly they would be more than happy for employment under a greater British empire. This is the future that the British need to strive for. And uh, it would lend to a control over a rogue state like Israel uh, by introducing a constitutional monarchy. Uh, this is why the monarchy is to be treasured, not to be uh, done away with. Uh, it's England's greatest asset. Uh, so with that in mind, 
uh, when it comes to the kind of influence that's ongoing in Russia, which uh, is uh, deeply affected, impacted by uh, the machinations of Israel. Uh, it's time for Americans to be educated geopolitically so they can understand why this is happening. But um, I, th I think that gives us a good overall perspective of Brexit, why it happened, uh, you know, potential repercussions if we work with history instead of fighting it. Um, and I think people now have a general background of uh, much of the uh, influence of Herodian elements, the Herodian insurgency of the Hazars. Uh, by all means, any other questions you may have? Well, I think you've covered it quite a lot, actually. Um, thank you. Um, why do they hate hate Christ then? Well, understand that uh, Christ was the Israeli Antichrist. To them, he represented a radical individual who encouraged or embodied the covenant of God with everyone instead of simply a quote unquote chosen people. Uh, rather than saying that this is our God, the Christ, which is a title, not a name, and he was anointed to that title by the Magi, which is why the revelation of the Magi is so important. Uh, when he was consecrated as the Christ, he extended the covenant of God to everyone on earth. This was considered uh, to be uh, a, it was an ontological catastrophe, a existential apocalypse for the Jewish people who considered themselves the only people of God. But we also have to understand that the God of the Bible is not the true Christian God. The true Christian God, well, if you're a Christian, I think most of you would understand that your God would not demand the mass sacrifice of an entire nation of women and children uh, to be conducted in his name. That's yeah. not the God of Christ. Who, 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 who is the God of the Bible? Is that, uh, you said he was a Cthulhu. Um, so where did that originate from, that Cthulhu? Oh, well, let's let's try and articulate this a bit more uh, so that there's not a misunderstanding. Uh, it's important to understand that um, what you've heard me articulate is the fact that, and this is important, uh, it, the fact is that uh, the ancient Jewish culture, uh, the true Jewish culture uh, that evolved in the um, Southwest Asia, the Levantine, that gifted humanity so much, such as the Kabbalah, uh, which I think is indispensable as a cultural gift to humanity. Uh, this Jewish culture uh, was dealing in producing one of the rarest dyes, meaning a uh, coloration of cloth in the past. And understand that we have to project ourselves to that time period. Uh, this is unimaginable today when we can walk around with a riot of color, any color that we want. We can uh, basically uh, uh, wear anything we want and, uh, and, and uh, just change according to mood. This wasn't the case in those times. Uh, you had people who were of a lower class or stature that had very little materially, and whatever materials they wore were the colors of local products such as wool or what yarn, whatever they were putting together would be the color basically of their surroundings. These were people who did not, could not uh, convey any sense of fashion per se. Uh, and so you could easily distinguish immediately people by sight. Um, when you saw how a person was dressed, what kind of clothes they were wearing, what color those clothes were, then you would understand that this person was a priest, this person was a nobleman, this person was a slave. Uh, so uh, the slaves would probably be naked, as a matter of fact, dressed only in chains, or uh, at least cuffs or bands to indicate their bondage. 
uh, when it came to uh, the caste consciousness, not just class consciousness, but caste consciousness, almost as in the sense of a, a colony of ants, uh, you would have this sense of who was who uh, by birth, uh, but you knew who they were by how they dressed. So when someone approached uh, the colors, the more colorful they were, the wealthier they were, and uh, the most precious of all colors were the hardest colors to dye and and absorb into cloth and press into uh, something that would identify that person as well special. And uh, there was, of course, uh, the sense of coloration that was gifted as a secret alchemically, formulaically by God to the Jews. This was the Tekelet blue. And uh, when it comes to God, think of the blue of the sea and the blue of the sky. And when you take a look at the, well, my father was a sailor, my legal father, the man who raised and guided me, chief petty officer of the United States Navy, George Joseph Henry Dietrich. And as a man of the sea, he, of course, was subjected all his life to a view of the sea and the sky and nothing else for very long periods of time. So when you take a look at the sea and the sky and they're both shades of blue, being they're really the, the only disambiguation on the horizon line uh, was which color blue they were. And sometimes that got confused during a storm. It's a Terra. Well, uh, think of the mystique of that. And if you were to, to try and capture that blue, say if you were to try and put it into a container. Well, if you tried to capture the sky in a jar, you can close the lid and say this is full of sky, full of oxygen. Scientifically, it is, but it's not going to be blue. It's going to look translucently clear to you. You'll see nothing. Matter of fact, if you've got a jar full of oxygen, you would be tempted to become an atheist. I see no God here. Water you take from the sea would be the same. It would be no longer blue once separated from the ocean. It would be clear. There'd be nothing there to identify as divine. So the blue became the color of God. The tekelet blue was derived from uh, the mollusk of the millennium, uh, a particular snail, and uh, when, the trunculus snail. And uh, this trunculus snail was confused because, or rather, um, the Jewish people became confused because of the loss of the secret of the trunculus snail. What happened was that uh, in the Bible, our Jewish uh, writings, Talmudic, they describe uh, this creature, which is the shape of the sea, which shoots forth its legs to capture prey from which the dye can be extracted. And a particular school of Judaic rabbis began to misinterpret this malevolently via the subversion and insurgency as the Hilozon, the Cthuloid cuttlefish from which is derived the toxin that the Third Reich would later use to poison people to death in the gas chambers, which creates a blue that coats the walls called Prussian blue. This is the horrible irony of the Zionists and Zionism. Zionism became Cthuloid. Well, always was, because the rabbis who inspired Zionism demanded that people accept the concept of the Hilozon, the Cthuloid cuttlefish, as the source of the godly colors. This is the kind of coloration of blue you see on the Israeli flag. When it comes to the real source of the blue, the trunculus snail, this was lost to the Jewish people. The Zionists instead uh, declared an allegiance, in effect, to Cthulhu, who was mentioned in the Quran as the great forsaker, the great abandoner. Beware, for Shaitan, Satan, is al Cthulhu the great forsaker. So this is the Cthuloid element of Zionism. And this is all part of the Edomite nature of Zionism because Cthulhu is one of the anti-gods of the Edomites, one of the kings of Edom. So what we need to understand is the true Jewish people, the people of the original tribes, scattered when Israel was sundered 
they became known as the Lost Tribes, the Lost Tribes of Israel. One of them ultimately made it to Japan. Their descendants live there today, the Makuya people of Japan. Uh, the Makuya people of Japan understand that the relics of the Yamato dynasty, the treasures are embossed with the seal of David, the uh, heirs to the Davidian throne. This is why the Americans wanted to exterminate the Japanese in World War II. It was their stated objective. Anyone who thinks I'm being uh, melodramatic here is only advertising their ignorance. Americans published in Life magazine and any publicly accessible source during the war that the stated objective of the United States government and the American people was the complete and total annihilation and eradication of the Japanese. They were dedicated to a Holocaust. This was an Edomite Cthulhuid Holocaust on the part of the Americans where they hoped to capture those ancient Davidian relics of the Japanese and reverse engineer them and attain the secrets of God himself for themselves. Of course, the Americans lost that war. If they had not lost that war, if they had won indeed, they would have taken those relics. Those relics are not in American hands at all, and Americans are not allowed to see them. So people need to understand that uh, the true Jewish culture reestablished itself in Japan. This is why the Americans hated the Japanese, but why the Americans did their best to drive the Japanese to war. Uh, this is something that, uh, of course, the people of Israel will do anything to hide and uh, would immediately go into paroxysms of rage at my expressing the truth. Uh, but this is the truth the world needs to know. It was Japanese who called on the kamikaze, the divine wind, to sink the fleet of the Mongols, the largest loss of human life at sea in human history. Uh, a fleet the size of the fleet off the Normandy beaches at D-Day was sunk within seconds by the kamikaze, the divine wind. When the Japanese called on the kamikaze again in World War II, by sacrificing themselves, not other people, but themselves in suicide attacks against the Americans, they succeeded in calling the divine wind. The Americans never write it in their history books, but the Americans expended thousands and thousands of lives in an island hopping campaign that they claim won the Second World War. What was the ultimate culmination of this island hopping campaign? A fleet the size of D-Day was necessitated to conquer the small island of Okinawa, the capital of the Ryukyu's island chain. This is not Japanese people. These are Sinitic people. Unlike the Japanese who were strict vegetarians uh, before World War II and throughout the war, the Okinawans eat pork. They're descended from the Chinese. They have their own national flag. People can look this up. The Americans were not invading Japan, but the island nation of Okinawa are the Ryukyus, the kingdom of the Ryukyus, centered on their capital of Okinawa, Operation Iceberg. This required a fleet the size of D-Day to do just that. 80% of the Marines who invaded that island never made it to the shore. Those that did committed themselves to atrocities so inhuman, so barbaric, so unspeakable, eating people while they were alive, roasting women on spits and babies. The, they did was so horrible that more Okinawans killed themselves to avoid being captured by the Americans than Japanese were killed by atomic bombs at Hiroshima and Nagasaki combined. Think about what I just said. More Okinawans killed themselves to avoid capture by the Americans that Japanese died at Hiroshima and Nagasaki combined. What the Americans did was literally unspeakable, and yet they lost the war. What was the purpose of that invasion? The purpose of the invasion was not simply senseless, gratuitous sadism. The idea was this was the gateway to Japan. You can look that up. Anyone can online. Okinawa, gateway to Japan. The idea was to launch the invasion of Japan itself from the Okinawan Isles. 
Yet when the Americans established all of their forces on Okinawa, aircraft carriers, landing barges, all of the facilities to provide medical, logistical support, the divine wind arose. Out of the Pacific arose Typhoon Louise. My father was on board the USS Pittsburgh, and he was lucky they survived. The storm was so violent that on his ship, the bow was snapped off. The fact that they could make it to an island where they could replace it with a wooden bow until they could reach Hawaii was nothing short of a miracle. Other people weren't so lucky. By the time Typhoon Louise changed direction like an intelligent animal, angular direction no less, it made sharp right turns as if it were directed by someone with a joystick and it hit Okinawa directly. It wiped out the American invasion fleet. It destroyed so many aircraft carriers and landing barges and personnel that the Americans had to arrange an evacuation operation called Operation Magic Carpet to carry all the injured Americans home and rescue them before they died. Literally, people would have starved to death, Americans stranded on Okinawa, the island they had just invaded, if the Americans hadn't pulled out a massive evacuation effort to rescue them. The invasion of Japan was impossible. Their entire invasion fleet was wiped out. The Americans keep this out of the history books with a passion. They will kill to keep people from knowing about it. They've attempted to kill me recently. My injuries are still visible. But when it comes to what the Americans did and what they lost, people can still look it up. Typhoon Louise and its damage to the American war effort to invade Japan. The kamikaze was summoned by the Japanese because they are the true people of the Davidian line who possess the Artilica, the ancient relics of the Davidian throne that have an occult and supernatural impact on the world around us. This is something that the Americans attempt to hide behind this facade of false technology, saying that atomic bombs ended the war. Now they try and say, oh, it was the Russians who ended the war, putting the Soviets on a level with nuclear power, trying to portray the Russians as the master race. We've seen the Russians are no master race and that all they said about World War II and winning it is a lie. They can't even advance in Ukraine. These are simply people who have no military capability. All of it was a myth. The only ally that has an imperial history with any solid military experience is Great Britain from the major allies, the big three of World War II. And Britain needs to take advantage of that, uh, use that as it always has historically. This is a time in history which is apocalyptic and nations do need to stand for themselves. Uh, Britain has been forced into a position where that's unavoidable now. So perhaps that's for the best, even though it came about for the most, well, the most self-destructive of reasons. Irrational belief that union with Europe was somehow uh, surrendering to the ghost of Adolf Hitler, uh, all based on Russian propaganda uh, that they were... Uh, in threat of losing their culture, uh, the British at least now have the ability to strike back and reverse the roles. Since Russia was occupying Britain and uh, forcing the British to tolerate the, the deployment of weapons of mass destruction in their own capital, uh, I think it's ironic karma that Russia def be defeated by the British in Ukraine and Ultimately, that the British help in the reconstruction process that would reorient Russia with the West on the basis of a reconstructed economy, a new greater British Raj with many Russians serving as native troops, mercenaries, as they're already serving via the, the Wagner group in the field of battle. When it comes to the uh, concept of the Hilozon, Cthulhu, the Edomites, the important thing to remember is that um, Herodian, or the term Herodian, would refer more to the kind of ideology that manifests in Israel today, the kind of ideology that uh, prompts Israel to side with Muslims 
in the destruction of entire Christian populations. Uh, make no mistake about it. What the Israelis are engaged in, when people speak of Israeli genocide in Palestine, as horrible as the Palestinian situation is, and it is existential, uh, you have an entire people living on the precipice for eternity at the moment, what seems like an eternity until the world does something about it, or you have something that is even more immediate. The Armenian people are threatened with true genocide in the most immediate and total sense by their Turkish and Azeri nations, which border them and have them locked in a vice. The Israelis support closing that vice and wiping Armenia off the map. They're supporting it with all the weapons and finance that they can. This is where they're truly engaged in genocide. And unless humanity protects its fellow Christians, they will succeed. This is Herodian. The Edomite ideology is more international, just as you had Christ declare a covenant with all peoples on earth. The Edomites did so through their cults, and these cults are the cults of the anti-gods, the kings of Edom, cults of Cthulhu and yog uh, shub uh, These are entities which Howard Phillips Lovecraft tried to warn people of. Uh, he was going to go nonfiction because he was contracted by Henry Ford to write an American Mein Kampf for the man who would run for president on the fascist ticket, Charles Augustus Lindbergh. Both of these men were honored and respected by the Third Reich. That both of them had political and celebrity power in the United States. Uh, neither one of them could write worth a damn. So they hired Howard Phillips Lovecraft to write New America and the Coming World Order, the American Mein Kampf. He was then assassinated with the injection of cancer by Dr. Rhodes. Dr. Rhodes developed weaponized cancer in the 1930s by experimenting on Cubans and Puerto Ricans uh, and wrote publicly that he wanted to wipe the brown races of Latin America off the earth. And this genocidal maniac developed the bioweaponized cancer that could be injected into an individual and kill them. It was a rare disease in those days before all the nuclear testing. It was only after nuclear testing cancer became common. Before that, cancer was rare. H.P. Uh, Lovecraft was one of the few victims to fall to it. Most people who got it got skin cancer. These were like British explorers south of the tropics who, w with their white skin, were exposed to too much sun and developed basal cell carcinoma, like my father did as an American sailor crossing the equator too many times, being a Caucasian man, his fair skin couldn't take all the sun, and he developed one of the most aggressive cases of basal cell carcinoma the doctors had ever seen at Letterman Army Medical Center. They actually had to remove a portion of his skull to prevent the cancer that had permeated it from getting into his brain. He survived that operation and lived another 20 or 30 years. But when it came to Howard Phillips Lovecraft, too much had been injected into him and he died, a young man. Uh, this is the horror of this kind of insurgency, the Edomite insurgency that Lovecraft was warning us of. But what he did say in his novella, uh, Shadow Over Innsmouth, uh, in which he, uh, that was the only novella, a novel length story to be published in his lifetime. He had many short stories published in his lifetime, but nothing of that length. So in that book, it says the elder sign that is the ward against the anti-gods is the swastika. So that is stated because that's what it is. This is why the National Socialists chose this as their ward against the Edomite alliance that the Americans and their allies, the Bolsheviks, represented. This is what Hitler knew about uh, the Hilozon from H.P. Lovecraft. And H.P. Lovecraft, of course, was even uniting with men like, well, Harry Houdini, who himself was Jewish. But Harry Houdini was originally Zionist until he found out the 
Edomite nature of the Herodian insurgency of Zionism. And then he sided with H.P. Lovecraft. The two of them got together to write a book to expose this. This is all historical fact. Anyone can look up. Harry Houdini and H.P. Lovecraft had united to write a book that would uh, essentially uh, extinguish credulity on the part of Americans towards this phenomenon, which has driven America into a third world nation status in terms of quality of life. And that's why Harry Houdini was assassinated. The man who killed him was a known murderer. And yet that man faced no legal repercussions. He punched him in the stomach with a murderous blow that killed Harry Houdini. And then went on his merry way, a hired assassin. H.P. Uh, Lovecraft then died. Uh, these men were threats that were eliminated by the Edomites. These are the same people that threaten myself physically today. Uh, this is the same kind of horror that humanity has to learn to identify as the enemy of the human race. So, so did, 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 they, did they manage to write the book? None of them, no. Harry Houdini and uh, uh, H.P. Lovecraft never got to write their book. They certainly put it to paper that they had every intention of writing this book. So it's historically irrefutable, incontestable. This was their intent, but they were both killed before they could do it. H.P. Uh, Lovecraft was intent on writing the American Mein Kampf with, uh, for the, uh, as the ghost author for Charles Lindbergh, but of course was murdered before he could do that. Uh, so it was, these books never manifested. Uh, they were planned, uh, and, uh, and this is why H.P. Lovecraft was taken out. He was considered one of the greatest threats to the cults of Edom in the 20th century, if not the greatest threat. He himself was ultimately Arab descended. Uh, genealogically, his original name of his family was Hazard, uh, Hazard as in danger, which is an anglicization of Hazred, as in Abdul al Hazred, the so called mad Arab, right. one of the greatest. Through, through, yeah. through what books of his do you recommend people to read? Well, certainly The Shadow Over Innsmouth uh, is one in which he speaks of the Elder Sign, the swastika, as that ward against the anti-gods. Uh, this is something that, of course, uh, we have to remember is uh, why the sign is so feared by uh, postmodern uh, interest groups that seek to eliminate its display. Uh, remember that as a ward against the anti-gods, uh, uh, you, uh, you protect yourself from uh, their influence by having such a symbol on your person or in your home uh, and, of course, on state buildings uh, where you used to see them on state buildings throughout uh, official buildings in America. Uh, here in San Francisco, they're the Palace of Fine Arts, one of the uh, last buildings still standing from the American World's Fair of the 1930s, American built, not German. Uh, perhaps German architects were contracted or consulted, but it ha it displays its swastikas proudly here in San Francisco. And uh, this is because in that time it was understood to be a war against evil, uh, the influence of the Edomites and anti-gods. So in that sense, uh, we have a landmark, which is tribute to those times before this complete control of our media. This is what brings us back to the attack on media by Prince Harry and his legal representatives. This is uh, the attempt to control media, as always, and thereby control information, suppress the truth, the truth of who won the Second World War, the truth of whom uh, your enemy is. Uh, honestly, if there's any graffiti to be uh, sprayed on uh, the side of walls, it should be, who's your enemy? And uh, it's important to remember that it is ultimately for all humanity, the Edomites, the Herodian insurgency. This is a threat to us all. And this so, um, who, who, who did win the Second World War? I find that hard to understand because everyone was like, oh, Hitler was killed and now goodness has won and that's the end of it. So who, who did win and what went on there? What was the shadow play and, and why? Well, it's important to understand the power of propaganda and the power of propaganda is immense. Uh, 
the Reich's propaganda minister, Dr. Paul Joseph Goebbels, who was, of course, the man who uh, ran much of the media in the Reich, understand he was not the sole uh, monopolist of media in the Reich. He had a rival, uh, someone who was a relation of my legal father, uh, George Dietrich, a man named Otto Dietrich. Otto Dietrich was Hitler's press chief. And Otto Dietrich, unlike Joseph Goebbels, was Schutzstaffel of the SS. And Otto Dietrich, he was ultimately one of the men who introduced uh, my mother to Adolf Hitler when she was with the Party of Diplomats in Berlin on those diplomatic uh, sojourns, those envoys. Uh, it was men like uh, Otto Dietrich who uh, ultimately uh, made my mother resonate or appreciate the name of Dietrich. One reason she was atta attracted to the man who became my legal father, George Dietrich, uh, who was always convinced, went to his grave thinking he was my biological father. Uh, the chances of that are always possible, but they're extraordinarily slim for reasons I've articulated before. Uh, now, his exposure to radiation at many nuclear tests in the Pacific, for instance, etc. The fact that he had been married multiple times and had uh, at least five to six divorces before he married my mother because he could never produce a child. He was pretty convinced he was sterile himself. Uh, so uh, all that aside, when it comes to the war and uh, the power of propaganda, someone like uh, Joseph Goebbels, he would say, repeat the lie loud enough, boldly enough, often enough, People just wind up accepting it because they don't have the energy to investigate any further. Uh, this is the advice that was taken and run with by all of the allies. Also understand that the Reich's propaganda minister, Dr. Paul Joseph Goebbels, the name of his department was the Department of Propaganda and Enlightenment. This was the name of his department because his wife was Buddhist. So we're talking about a man who retained not just a sense of the Machiavellian, but a sense of the enlightened, of yeah. the spiritual. And that's important. And um, so he was not only trying to propagandize the people of the Reich and their allies, but to enlighten them, to enlighten them to the threat. So when it came to the threat, the threat is that the Allies weren't just a people or anti-culture who disseminated propaganda, as Paul Joseph Goebbels did, all that they purveyed and still purvey is propaganda. As Goebbels himself emphasized, and which he's never quoted from, he stated that his department disseminated both propaganda and enlightenment, but the allies, there's nothing but benightedness, nothing but keeping you in the dark. The allied mass media machines, good example, when they did a study in terms of social engineering recently and identified some of the most state manipulated mass media machines on earth, they found that three of the most centralized state manipulated mass media machines on earth were communist China, the military junta over Egypt, and the Australian mass media machine under the sole control of the monopolist Rupert Murdoch, who effectively controls effectively practically all media in Australia. In other words, everything your average person has access to in Australia is under control of a single man named Rupert Murdoch, who effectively rules Australia and has ruled it for generations. Whenever a politician turns against Rupert Murdoch, he character assassinates them and eliminates them from office, then installs his own puppet by having the media back that politician up 100%. Anybody who has ruled Australia has only done so at the behest or sufferance of Rupert Murdoch. Rupert Murdoch in Australia is the equivalent of Kim Jong-il in North Korea. 
Rupert Murdoch effectively does something worse than run the economy to the ground in Australia. He owns the minds and souls of every Australian. In effect, he controls their very thoughts. So you have a situation in which men like this infect the minds of Australians to the point where Australians truly believe that the supermassive fires which killed a billion animals in terms of Australian wildlife were generated by environmentalists to try and prove there was climate warming. This is the average Australian belief because this is what Rupert Murdoch tells them. It's the environmentalists that set those fires to try and convince us there's global warming. This is pure insanity. This is the insanity of the allies. The allies live in a world where there is no truth. There is nothing but lies. The lies are the fabric of how they perceive their unreality. So when it comes to what they can say, they can say anything they want and just say it loud enough and long enough so that people believe it. Here's a good example. Battle of Midway. At the Battle of Midway, uh, the Americans sank four Japanese carriers. And they say, this is the turning point of the war. It was an American Trafalgar. I mean, the idea of the Americans comparing themselves to Admiral Nelson is beneath contempt. It's beyond laughable. It's simply insane. The Japanese succeeded in their operation at the Battle of Midway in capturing the Alaskan island chain, a thousand miles of American territory from which they prevented America from directly bombing Japan. Because of this, the Americans had to spend the next four years building the Trans-American Highway through Canada in order to reach Alaska again. And throughout the war, one third of all American manpower and materials was devoted to trying to recapture Alaska. And at the same time, they had to conduct this enormously caught this enormously costly uh, island hopping campaign to capture these little spots of coral reef in the Pacific to finally make it to Okinawa, where they ultimately lost the fleet to the Ooh. divine wind, the kamikaze of Typhoon Louise. The Americans lost at Midway. They lost the war. Yet they say, it's our greatest victory. And they just keep saying it. The Russians, for instance, lost World War II when they invaded Berlin. Stalin told Zhukov, there are no more divisions. He told him flat out, yep. we are out of manpower. This is the bottom of the barrel. We have no more. And they lost a million men in Berlin. The Russians were eviscerated. Now, after the atomic bombs were dropped, then the Russians called up all these old World War I veterans. You can see it in the films where they're invading Manchuria and you've got these old World War I veterans on horseback waving cutlasses from World War I. And then they'll tell you, that's how we wiped out the Japanese. And the Americans will say, that Soviet invasion, that's what knocked the Japs out of the war. Forget the bomb, the Russians are the master race. Yeah, all these old World War I veterans on, war, on horseback with cutlasses. Yeah, they wiped out the Japs in Manchuria. I mean, none of this is even believable. It's literally insane. But this is the propaganda children have been raised on, and they believe it because they, all they have are these fairy tales. They don't have the truth. I'm the only one, the son of Adolf Hitler, telling you the truth because I worked for these fuckers for almost 10 years and saw all of their secrets. And they're all lies. Nothing they tell you is the truth, except perhaps in detail, certainly out of context. And half the time, the context is missing. That's why my transmissions are called critical omissions. Everything is critically omitted. So I do want to uh, let everyone know, of course, uh, that uh, I can't do this without the help of the public. So we do need public help for me to even continue doing this. So I do want people to know that both Christine Joanna Hart herself is struggling, Douglas Dietrich is struggling, and we do need your help. So do check into where you can help her. She'll tell you where. Certainly in my case, uh, all you need to do is tune into Douglas Dietrich, my channel on YouTube, 
And uh, you can find that by looking up Douglas Dietrich on YouTube. I'm fairly ubiquitous. You'll ultimately find one of my videos traced to my channel. And there you'll find um, where you can contribute, which I certainly need to just get through the month. Uh, and Christine Joanna Hart, you're certainly welcome to, to, to tell our listeners where they can help you. Oh, thank you. Um, yes, um, just contact me um, on um, Facebook. Chrissy Jo Hart um, or Twitter, Chris, Christine, Christine Hart on Twitter. And um, yeah, thank you for coming on, Douglas. And um, I see we're running out of time. I didn't realize. Um, and yeah, it was great, great to talk to you and, and very illuminating. Thank you very much. Well, bless you, honey, for your time. And we couldn't do it without you. Um, we have a few minutes left. Any other questions that you think could be tidied up quickly or do you want to uh, cut it down now? So um, what do you think, what do you think various people can do? I, I was a tiny bit confused about, do you think our British press are a good thing that we should be upset that they're shut down or are they propaganda machines anyway that we shouldn't care? Or do, should we view it as maybe a curtain falling, more of a curtain falling on us? I think that, it's important to realize that unlike Australia, Britain has more of a organic and fluid situation. Uh, the situation is that, of course, you have a media that has been subject to uh, control by people who have the money to purchase elements of the media, but you have much to be proud of. Some of the time, uh, the state machine a uh, British broadcasting company and the like have failed in their duty to uh, inform the public. Let's put it this way. Unlike the Third Reich, where Dr. Paul Joseph Goebbels was concerned with both propaganda and enlightenment, uh, no one ever even aspired toward enlightenment in any of the allied media machines. So people search for enlightenment. They're left on their own. Uh, it's kind of like uh, you're left with uh, the British media machine is kind of it's kind of what it is. It's basically I think the per best person to answer that is yourself. You've experienced the fact that you're used and abused as a person who has served as a public informant and uh, and they, they never really come to protect you or defend you or support you. Uh, it's one of these 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 horrible dog eat dog, uh, chew them up and spit them out kind of uh, environments where it is. Yeah, yeah. No, you're totally right. I mean, I, I did work for the mail for over 10 years. And when they decided because of the phone hacking, they wanted to get rid of private investigators, they just dropped me. And I'd become a journalist by that point with many, many bylines. But it was just like, oh, you'll be dropped. And I think now what you were saying about Goebbels repeating about people are bad, bad. Now what are they doing in court? This David Sherborne chap, um, he keeps saying Christine Hart did this, Christine Hart did that. And this week, this um, Graham Johnson chap is saying that I threatened him. Now he's like a gangster, a gangster kind of type of man that is from Liverpool, prides himself as being, oh, I'm a bit of a tough guy. I, wrote, I write about, you know, um, hard guys and drug dealers. I'm a true crime journalist. And he said, apparently, he was terrified of me and I threatened him. As I if, bet he I, was. I bet he was terrified of you. I'm sorry. <laughs> he, he has every reason to be. Time. You're the lady who took down the IRA. Uh, oh, thank you. <laughs> But it just made me feel like, hang on, I'm not like I felt. Am I, am I Al Pacino in Scarface? Like, say hello to my Leo friend. You know, I thought, what bullshit? Do you know what I mean? But oh, maybe he was terrified of me. Maybe people see me as, um, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. What do you think? Well, I think that you, you have been terribly used and abused and that this involves, of course, the deep state, uh, British intelligence, as well as uh, the uh, the estate of journalism. Uh, but uh, what um, 
what we need to say or the attitude that we need to establish is that Britain's journalism is free to extent, but its freedom is very, uh, it's very profit oriented. And for that reason, it can be very destructive and not, and not, and not necessarily constructive in the information it, it conveys. There certainly needs to be a rehabilitation, but um, at the very least, uh, as bad as it is, uh, there's more hope in Britain than there is in Australia at the moment. Uh, Australia is truly dystopian when it comes to its media. And uh, honestly, we can only hope for uh, uh, the death of Rupert Murdoch for the sake of all humanity. <laughs> but uh, when it comes to, by the way, for those who don't know, Rupert Murdoch runs Fox News in America. And for all these super patriotic Americans brainwashed by Fox News, they're they're basically obeying the mandate of some Australian who's not even an American. It's this is how maniacal the situation is with information dissemination. And um, the Russians took advantage of that and they basically uh, brought about a the situation we're in now where we have polarized communities. Britain is polarized, albeit it seems to have died down the 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 borderline civil war polarity between the Brexiteers and the uh, uh, I guess the Brexiteers would call them bitter enders or never enders who uh, feel that the on only solution, which by the way is truly the only practical solution, the most immediate solution for Britain's problems right now, would be to rejoin European Union. Uh, that's not going to happen, or is ex so extraordinarily unlikely to happen. I'm not banking on it. Uh, but, I, think, uh, I think, Douglas, that w we got flooded by a lot of people and there was a massive influx from all of Eastern Europe and it was quite overwhelming. So I think it <clears throat> it panicked people, I would say, and that's why, um, you know. But, but by the way, the man who predicted that was Algis Budries. Uh, during uh, World War II, Algis Budries was a British man whose wife was gang raped by home invading Americans. Yankees broke into his home, uh, tied him up and gang raped his wife in front of him. And Algius Budries was the author of Clockwork Orange. And in Clockwork Orange, he was describing uh, basically an overwhelming of England by Eastern European emigres. So he predicted this. And uh, the whole thing that happened was that uh, British needed a uh, population to do manual labor and various other jobs your average Eng Englishman did not want to engage in uh, what was beneath the average Englishman's dignity. And so these Eastern Europeans filled that role coming in through the European Union for many years. Um, and then what happened was with a Brexit, of course, that helps to mitigate that influence because that is no doubt, doubtless that was a source of much of the Russian propaganda. Um, and uh, but uh, now that that's been, um, shall we say, mitigated, uh, we have a situation. And by the way, for those who don't know, there was some of these Brexit politicians who literally had Russian prostitutes that they were caught with. This was exposed in British media. So British media did its job in exposing situations like that. But people never really understood the real threat of that context. Uh, but uh, when it comes to where we're at today, the important thing is that people support people who have been in media and have done their best to inform the British people of the truth. And that would include the lovely Christine Joanna Hart. And so do visit her Facebook page, uh, do purchase her books and uh, tell us about some of the books that you've published so I can upload them with this video, please. Oh, thank you. Um, well, I'll have to give you the images. I'm gonna upload them actually over the weekend. So I might be able to give you a link. Um, Great. The first one um, is called The Serial Killer Psychic, um, which as people know, I'm a psychic medium and a shamanic healer. So that will be about my life story, about the press, about becoming a psychic and how from childhood abuse, um, this extrasensory uh, gift um, exfoliated. So that is what that one is about. And um, there's a second there's a second one um, after that, which is about um, investigations and working for the press. So I'll actually give you links to both. Um, that will be over the weekend, if that's OK. Of course. What I'll do is I'll simply edit them into the video summary uh, so that people can link directly to them when they okay. come to me. And uh, 
Well, I love you dearly, Christine Joanna Hart, and I want to thank you so much for this opportunity for us to talk. I, I hope the rest of your day goes well, and um, uh, honestly, I know you've been through so many challenges, and uh, obviously you're not alone. All of England is struggling right now, certainly the majority of the English people. Uh, it's, it's, I'm, I, I'll stop myself there because I don't want to start using expletives that, that I've been told not to use when it comes to people like Rishi Sunak. <laughs> so, uh, hey, no more. <laughs> yeah. literally. Yes, um, oh, brilliant. Well, thank you, Douglas. And, um, always a pleasure. <laughs> thank you so much. The honor is mine. You have a blessed day and I'll stop recording now. Um, so let's press that button. And 